sponsored in part by dollarseed.com for your flowers vegetables and herbs all organic seeds all only a dollar a pack dollarseed.com and by willspringssoap.com handmade soaps with simple recognizable ingredients making soaps using the cold kettle process while using traditional methods willspringssoap.com minority.com authentic haven brand 100 percent natural soil conditioner for the home garden all your vegetables herbs and flowers minority.com always free shipping Squirm and worm farm organic farm and gardening supplies it's conveniently located in plymouth wisconsin worm castings organic potting soil organic and heirloom seeds cover crop seeds and more squirmandwormfarm.com Welcome to Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Extra. I'm Joy Baird. This is one of the TP trellises that we've made, featured on other series that we do. Now we're going to use this and we're going to plant some pole beans today on it. And there's a specific way that we're going to go about planting pole beans. We're going to soak them first, but not in just water. So we've got our manure tea brewing here. And the reason why we brewed manure tea this week was so we could soak our pole beans in it and any type of beans you can soak and it'll accelerate the germination period by up to three days. We chose manure tea because one, you brew, brew them in these cute little tea bags like this and it one to five gallons for one to three days. And the difference between this type of brewing of manure tea or compost tea is there's no aeration stones needed. There's no unpleasant fragrance and the manure tea can pour, be poured directly on the root system or sprayed on the plants whenever you're in the garden. Thank you, thanks. So with that being said, we've got five gallons here. We've soaked our seeds. We're gonna plant our seeds and then with the remaining manure tea, we'll just water some of the plants that we have started in the garden. If you want to know, want to know more about manure tea and how the whole process works, you can visit the link in the show notes from our good friend Arlena Schott with her program, Garden Wise Living. And she actually visited the Authentic Haven brand company and owner Annie, Annie Haven in Southern California and sh shows us how all of this comes together. So let's go over the pole bean trellis and get some of these beans planted. So with these pole beans, we got them in our little cup here. I'm gonna take some of the weeds out of the area here. And with the pole beans, I'm just gonna trench them just like I would regular bush beans. And we're just going to plant them, and again, by soaking them, it's going to really speed up the germination process. And that's the whole key to get with planting here, is getting them uh, established as quick as possible. So with the rain, remaining manure tea there, I'm just going to go ahead and so put it in the soil where we're going to plant the beans. A couple of them came out. We're just going to maneuver them around a little bit. Okay, so you can see that they have gotten much plumpier, I guess is the word to use, as these are soaked for 24 hours. And I'm going to space them conservatively five inches apart. And as they become established, they're going to crawl up this thing. And in years past, they have exceeded the height of this teepee trellis and kind of created their own trellis and come back down a little bit. So it's going to be... Uh, a fun experiment with these being soaked like this. And again, if you've never soaked beans or peas before, go ahead and try it. It's very beneficial to the seed itself. And these will take approximately 60 to 70 days to reach maturity. And we've got them in the sunniest part of the garden, and that's where you want your beans to be. They will grow in partial shade, but will not grow as uh, productive as they would if they were in full sun. And then here is our Jerusalem artichokes that we planted. And as they get established, I'm going to wait until they're about uh, a foot to 16 inches tall before I plant the exact same method of pole beans around them and actually use those as a natural growing trellis as well. This is our shelf trellis that we featured on one of our Sunday series, Straight to the Point. We're going to use this for a lot of our squash and melons that we're growing this year in a combination with the squashed cage that we're about to construct. We're going to use wire, rubber coated wire meshing or fencing and to corral it. Last year, if you remember, we had a very small cage and the squash got out of control and out of it. So we're going to compensate for it and bring it, make a larger cage. And there's a couple of different options that we're going to follow in this. And one may be simply laying a tarp down and then putting our self-watering containers on that tarp. 
Secondly, maybe taking a straw bale, busting the straw bale, and using it as mulch on top of the soil. And then if we want to actually plant something in the ground, we can do that without damaging the tarp. So basically what we're going to construct today is just the squash cage perimeter. And then we can decide later within the next couple of weeks on how we're actually going to go about planting our squash in the cage. So let's get started here. So we're getting our side up here, and this is just rubber coated wire fencing here that I found on junk day a couple years ago. Works really well. We're going to get uh, this side up, the west side. We're going to see how far we have for the east side, and then we've got some other uh, galvanized light fencing that we've used for cucumbers before, and we'll strep stretch along the west side. And we're going to have a gate uh, back there, like we had last year. And then when we run out of wire on this side, we're going to have a gate as well, so we can access both sides. So we don't have to track through the garden to uh, get in the cage. And you know, keep in mind, we're not trying to keep cattle in. We're just trying to put kind of a barrier up for squash and to contain it a little more than if you just allow it to run wild in your garden. So I'm just disassembling a little bit of the fencing that I modified last year and to maximize, get another foot out of it because I had it zip tied uh, a foot more than what we needed. So we'll get uh, get the zip tied and we'll get uh, the side of the, that other side up. There was many different options that we could use to make our squash cage, and we ran out of the rubber coated mesh fencing. We could have used this galvanized stuff, which we kind of thought we might have, but we decided to use something that we had in the shed. We call it snow fencing. Now I'm not sure if that's the correct technical industrial term, but it looks like it's going to work very well. It's very sturdy. We're going to put a couple more fence posts in the back here to add stability. And the initial plan is here is to straw this down and use our self-watering containers in here, as we talked about a little bit earlier there. Uh, the tarp thing, I think, is going to be a little uh, not as e environmentally friendly with that, uh, going with the tarp. We'll have probably cucumbers running on the outside of that side and potentially pole beans running on this side. Now, I left the back open for a reason, because in the three years that we've had this shelf trellis, squash has never seemed to want to grow this way. They've always wanted to grow out this way. So if it does have the instance that squash is growing out towards the, uh, the line there, we will just put up some more fencing that we have at the small garden. If you like what you see, feel free to subscribe and comment. I'm Joy Baird, and we put a video out each and every Tuesday. And this has been a Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Extra. For more information, you can visit our website at thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com.